You are tuned into How you doing? the Habo Radio Station everyone loves. Good afternoon. Uh, you're listening to a special edition of Talking to the Max on J Air 87.8 FM. And today we'll be looking at um, a panel discussion looking at Melbourne Jury 2050. And that really means looking at Melbourne Jury today and the social and political and religious trends that uh, we're forming now. Uh, first, let me introduce our panelists. And our guests are Rabbi James Kennard, who is the principal of Mount Scopus. Uh, so an educator and a rabbi uh, who is in daily touch with the, the Jewish adults of the future, uh, which is a nice way to start. Jennifer Huppert is president of the Jewish Community Council of Victoria. Uh, the umbrella body of Melbourne's Jewish institutions, which is very active across a range of important community issues, including, lately, child safety, uh, the media, Aboriginal recognition, youth and drugs, and a host of other issues uh, that have come up. And Michael Fisher is president of Orgis, the Australian Union of Jewish Students, and representing the tertiary students of Australia, and I guess the leaders of our community in 2050. So welcome everybody to our show today. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having us. I, I'm actually quite positive about where we're heading in 2015. I think it will be a different community than we have now. Mm -hmm. uh, the statistics, as you show, show that fewer people are sending their children to Jewish day schools. Uh, fewer people are perhaps identifying as Jewish in traditional ways, but we still have many people who identify as Jewish in a variety of different ways. And I think one of the things that is an indication of that is some of the growth of things like Sheer Madness, the Jewish Writers' Festival, the Jewish Film Festival. Um, so I think we'll have a different looking community. Mm -hmm. It may be that people identify, it may be a less religious community in some respects, people mm -hmm. identifying in ways other than in traditionally religious ways. But we still will have, I think, a vibrant Jewish community in 20. Yes, I think that's one of the issues that comes up, comes through is that, is that more people, younger people these days, regard themselves as traditional, traditionally Jewish rather than or ethnically Jewish, ra rather than necessarily being religiously Jewish. They're proud of being Jews and having a Jewish background, but they don't identify religiously to the same extent. I believe. I think it's cultural, mm -hmm. but I think that reflects. I mean, the Jewish community is a microcosm of the broader community. Mm -hmm. And I think that reflects the statistics in the broader community. Mm -hmm. What I think was interesting, though, about the statistics you talked about, about volunteering, if you look further into those statistics about volunteering, mm -hmm. the greatest difference between Jews volunteering and non-Jews volunteering is amongst young people. So the proportion of young Jews who volunteer compared to the broader community is much uh, there's a greater difference than there is generally amongst volunteers and I think that bodes well for the future of the community that we have a higher proportion of young people volunteering. Mm -hmm. And that also I think has something to do with the Jewish day schools, Jewish youth movements who encourage that type of activity. But right. that also is a good sign for the future. Right, like that. Um, well, good afternoon. Um, Obviously, it's very hard to predict what the community is going to look like in 34 years yes. and how many trends that uh, occur as a result of many outside factors of which we have no control and many outside influences. And who knows, there might be another immigration from another community like we saw 30 years ago from mm. South Africa and mm. before that from Europe and so on. However, I think there are some things that we can extrapolate from what we have today. I would agree with Jennifer in some respects, but there's certain aspects of the vibrancy of the current Jewish community that will still be with us for a long time. Um, and our youth groups and our schools, which I think both of which are doing a tremendous job in engaging young Jewish people and giving them a positive sense of Jewish identity. Um, some of the other cultural activities which Jennifer mentioned are also very important and I'm sure will continue. Our connection with Israel, our passionate connection with Israel, and the fact, for good or for bad, that many of our young people go to live in Israel, I think will be something that will continue. But I do think that the figures that you raised, the intermarriage figures, mm -hmm. will actually be the defining factor in projecting where we'll be in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you said, with, with an intermarriage rate as high as it is, and in fact if you look at the Gen 08 survey, and if you look at the key demographic, the 25 to 35 year olds, and if you add in cohabiting couples, we've got an intermarriage rate of about 50%. Mm -hmm. If you take also the figures that you uh, showed, shared with us about how many children 
of an intermarried couple identify as Jewish, you'll realize mm -hmm. that the community is heading for a much smaller community very quickly. Mm. I mean, if we have an intermarriage rate of 50%, and of the children of intermarried couples, only 50% are raised as Jewish, that means in one generation, mm. we've gone down by 40%. That's right. In two generations, we've gone down by approaching 70%. Uh, I think, therefore, in 2050, we're looking at a much smaller community. Ironically, I think, from in pure statistical terms, it'll look more religious, because I think it'll be the religious part of the community which is less affected by this attrition. It is affected, but to a much lesser extent. I actually think this... It also has a higher birth rate. And also has a higher birth rate. I think this is an existential crisis for our community. I am actually disappointed that not more people are talking about it. Um, and it's absolutely true, as Jennifer says, that young Jews in particular, are finding different ways to express their Jewish identity. However, the picture that we can see from America is that after one or two generations of intermarriage, they're not identifying as Jews at all. That's right. They are people of Jewish origin or of Jewish ancestry. Um, although the issue is not whether we're a big community or a small community, we don't get prizes for having big numbers. But in terms of our sustainability, in terms of Jewish continuity, in terms of the classic question, will we have Jewish grandchildren? Mm -hmm. uh, I think the figures are very alarming. What, what are the positive others? Mm. Um, I don't know. What, Michael, what do you think are some of the positive others? What, what's going to make somebody become interested in identifying their, Jew, their Judaism? There's an Australian um, Jewish educator who moved to the States called David Breifman. Um, and he actually just became a Schusterman Fellow. Um, and, and he said something which was very interesting. And it's, it's, you know, it's not just what are you against, but what are you for? Um, mm -hmm. And all of these, um, you know, different, you know, parts of our community, um, there, there's a few things 100% that we're impacted by. We're definitely impacted dramatically by the Holocaust and as well dramatically by Israel. And um, the issue is we then, as, as, um, as James was saying, become quite responsive in the way that we identify with these two core parts of our identity. But we're not, no one's, you know, articulating a positive vision to, um, to connect to the Holocaust and a positive vision to connect to Israel. Um, but there is, and, and, and on the Holocaust, you can actually look at the Sydney Jewish Museum. They're, they're now opening a new exhibit, which mm. is a permanent exhibit that actually, you know, says these are the lessons of the Holocaust. This is the current issue that we're facing in the world, and this is what we have to do to link the two together. And that's how they're articulating a positive vision of how you can do Holocaust commemoration. And, and in terms of Israel, yeah, it's 100% right. Like, you don't want to be a Zionist if being a Zionist means waving a flag on campus and, like, and yelling. It's terrible. It's a terrible thing to do at the time. It's much more interesting to meaningfully engage with um, what should be a really interesting and, and diverse society. But that message of, of what Israel is, is, is lost in the fact that, you know, through school, through, um, especially through gap years, I think there's too much of a focus on, on content, which is about when you get back, you fight for us on campus. It's like, no, just connect with, you know, connect with Israel as any you know, mm. ordinary Zionist would. Well, it's I must say, Michael, certainly in our school, and I think this is the case in all schools, we're very much moving away, or we've moved away a long time ago from just the bare, banal flag, flag waving. Once a mm. year on Yamas Look, we wave a lot of flags. But um, we are very interested in forming a real connection to a real country in a warts and all sense, based on an emotional connection but very much buttressed by a real um, a knowledge of what's going on in Israel and a connection to the real country. Mm -hmm. um, to be honest, we've been asked many times to create uh, advocacy classes and although we want to give our students the ability to defend Israel, I've actually shied away from advocacy classes in a capital A because I don't want that to be the nature of their connection to Israel. Yeah. That Israel is something I'm connected to because I have to defend against its detractors. Mm. I want the connection to Israel to be much more profound, much more real, much more true, much more meaningful. The, the issue we face is that we actually have a lot of Jewish students coming to us that want to, you know, they want to join orders because they want to advocate for Israel. Um, and we have to explain that, you know, Advocating for Israel and um, and it, it's it's something we do, but you know we're primarily an Australian Jewish organisation, and mm. we like our purpose is to empower political leadership, and of course a part of our entity is Israel, but it's a part, it's not the core, um, and we have to really like take people when they come in, um, and I mean a really significant group of people that come in, we have to do this and reshape them to realise that you know there's a, a lot more to Zionism than than actually advocating for Israel. I don't say you're a fault for that whatsoever, but um, <laughs> but I don't know. I, I feel like there's there's a, a serious risk in our community that we're framing um, <coughs> Zionism 
as something you do as a matter of defence rather than something you want to do in a more meaningful way to connect with an identity. So that, having said a number of times in this discussion how important it is to articulate the positive and not get that bogged down of a negative, um, I also want to ask you uh, answer the question you asked a while ago about increasing levels of anti-Semitism. I believe it is coming, pretty. and it's not pretty. No. Um, what's happened in the UK and America, and to a much worse extent in, in mainland Europe, is those views that used to be on the fringes, usually of the left, have now become mainstream. The view that Israel, as, as Michael put it, is a pariah state, that Zionism is inherently bad, that Israel was created in sin. Those views, which when I was on campus hundreds of years ago, were the issues that we were fighting the, the extreme left on, are now in the mainstream of the Labour Party, yes. as we have seen in the last few in, days with Ken Livingstone and so yes. on, um, and are sensible talking points amongst civilized people. Now, in Europe, as we know, it's got to the state where, in some countries, Jews are literally scared to identify as Jews on the street. Um, there are mass exoduses from France and some other European countries. Uh, but even here, the sort of things that Bob Carr has been saying would not have been imaginable 20 years ago. No. And when he talks about a Jewish lobby controlling uh, uh, Australian politics, politics yes. which is outright blatant anti-Semitism, yes, and this is a man who until recently was the Foreign Minister of Australia and is still a highly respected figure in the Labour Party, and I don't want to be partisan here, I think it's across the board, mm. these views which are crossing the line between extreme anti-Zionism into anti-Semitism anti are now yes. becoming more acceptable. Okay. Uh, and I think this is a trend that is going to continue and we have to be very concerned about. Okay.